So um, let's all give a round of applause for Clifford. I'm going to clap for myself, is that yes, right? Yes, go for it. <laughs> clap for yourself. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, I'm Clifford. Uh, my real name is Sean, if you really want to know my real name. Um, I don't keep it too private. Should I move this over here, Bash? Yes. Beep, beep, beep. Nice. Okay. So first off, I want to let you all know that I have a terrible fear of public speaking, and I force myself to do this kind of stuff every now and then because I like to scare myself. I don't know why I do that, but that's how I make sure I'm alive. Um, wow. There we go. A little about, about me. I'm a UVU graduate down in uh, Utah County. I'm a Wireshark slash packet capture aficionado. That's kind of where I got my start in IT. Um, I worked on a WAMLAN analysis team for 10 years, so pretty much live by the packet, die by the packet. That's kind of how I got my start in IT. I have strong opinions about VLANs. If you ask me about them, make sure you have an hour or two, maybe three. Nothing. Uh, outside of computer stuff, I uh, like mountain biking, old school stereo systems, making, breaking, tinkering, who doesn't, uh, fast cars, 3D printing, and most breakfast foods. So let's okay. talk a little bit about my inspiration for home automation. Um, who can recognize the picture on the right of the Nekatomi Plaza directory? Uh, oh, um... It's Die Hard. It is Die Hard. Or first one. First one, yeah. That, for me, was the most amazing thing I ever saw, because I'm like, it's like an interactive thing you can touch on a screen and find people and things happen. I need that in my house, even though I was a kid at the time. But I'm like, I need that in my house. And then the other the other picture there is the old new tone intercoms. Anyone see a house with one of those back in the day? Maybe not new tone, but I've seen a house a that still has one. Yeah, right. Functional. Oh, there you go. Hey, I'm all for that. So I had a friend growing up that had one of those, and the fact that his mom could call us to dinner or whatever with that, I thought was amazing. I'm like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like. Six-year-old, eight-year-old Clipper was super impressed by that. So then I'm like, someday my house will have an intercom. Well, then cell phones got invented and intercoms kind of went away. That said, I did set up my own PBX server with the VoIP phones in every room of my house once just to emulate that to do it. And then it came to the stunning realization that I live by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd literally do all call and be like, hey, everyone, can you hear me? Oh, they must not hear me. No. Yeah, I, I did that. It was super cool. I ripped it all out because it was really embarrassing. But that's what I did. <laughs> um, so that kind of got me started. I started with X10. Does anyone remember X10 in a home automation world? They had the worst website on, this, on the planet that literally looked like a scam. And you put your credit card number in willingly, and they deliver you the cheapest made electronics this side of uh, China. It was fantastic. Um, they had a rudimentary system where you could actually tie that into the worst software you've ever seen. Originally it was a serial cable. I had the USB version because they came a little bit later. Very unreliable. Like you would push a button and it would sit there and think and think and think. If you got it under a second, you were impressed. Um, your chime, they had little door chimes when the sensors would open, they had a little like the door just open chime. Very friendly sound, super great. At 2 a.m. without fail, it turned into their alarm module randomly and was like a 95 decibel siren. Um, I was married once. X10 is not the reason for my divorce, just in case you're curious. It didn't help, I'll be honest, it didn't help. Uh, a few nights of having that si siren go to 95 decibels and wake you up, that got ripped out pretty quick. Um, they did what were called home codes and device codes, which is how they did their stuff. Um, I'll show you. I actually have some pictures of my original stuff I bought, which is kind of fun. Um, We've got, this is when I sold it on eBay, lol. Uh, so this was my Active Home Pro that's tied to a computer and had a little USB on it. Uh, these little guys were called socket rockets. You just put them right into a, a socket. And this, is, this used the power lines to communicate with each other. They used the power lines in your home. Which means if they were on one side of your house, you couldn't talk to the other side of your house. So you'd have to actually get phase couplers. Uh, you had lamp modules that you better not ever put any resistive load on because <laughs> you'll let the magic smoke out. Um, you have these really cute switches that were just basically powered by a button cell that you just glued to your wall to make it look like you had real automation. Uh, <laughs> these were your, these actually went in the walls. These hummed like crazy. Like you would push the button and like you could hear the audible hum. Oil wine? The, I don't know what the actual root cause was. They didn't last long as, they, as you can see. Um, I kind of went all in because they had these deals where you'd buy one appliance module, get 30 random items free because I think they wanted people to adopt this. Uh, you had little key fobs to turn stuff on and off, super cool. Um, these were their motion sensors, and they had cool names like this was an eagle eye because it was outdoor, and this was a hawk eye because it was indoor. Um, they just ran out of AA batteries. 
Uh, this was that fancy coupler. You actually plug that into your dryer vent, and it coupled your two <laughs> X10 sides. So it from one face. Yep, yep. That was that. Um, that was actually my dad's. He he. We all went on the, the, when, when we do projects around my family. Like we're all makers. I come from family makers. We we'll usually let one person kind of forge the way and run down that path, and then we're like, okay, it looks like it works. Now everyone in. This one I gave the go live way too fast. <laughs> way too fast. So they used to say we had a giant uh, X10 Exodus. They had these beautiful 480p cameras that uh, were wireless and you could control with these little gray remotes. Um, they were terrible. Like, they were the worst. You couldn't see a thing, but they were there. And then this, I think, was my all-in-one that I sold. Like, that, that's that module. This guy right here, if you can see this one, that's the screeching demon at 2 a.m. That's it, <laughs> right there. I almost kept it all, but for some reason, some other people like had Stockholm Syndrome with X10, and they paid premiums for this on eBay, so off it went. But that's where I started, but it was enough to kind of give me that scratch. Like, I, I love the, the itch of home automation. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. That's where I started. So then, I went to this guy. Has everyone ever seen one of them? That's a Veras platform, V-E-R-A, uh, Z-Wave platform. That thing was the newest hotness when I, when I first started in that. Um, ran, it ran Z-Wave. It talked Z-Wave. Very first Gen 1 Z-Wave, no encryption, just flat Z-Wave. It worked by and large, and then the update stopped. And then the update started again, I got all excited. And then they outpaced my hardware, because I had an old Gen 1, and it just died one day. And I was like, oh. So who's done Z-Wave? Has anyone done Z-Wave in here? Who knows the magic of unpairing and having to repair your devices in Z-Wave? So by magic, you mean... You have to unbind everything and rebind it to your new controller. Yes. Well, you have to. Factor reset is a thing. Yeah, <laughs> so you have to unbind and rebind. So then I went to buy Lowe's and they had this Iris platform. I'm like, that sounds interesting. And I went and I bought my first piece and it's like, <laughs> monthly payment? Nope, took that back. <laughs> but then I said, wow. They're... I think they used a bastardized version of Zigbee. They had both. They did Z-Wave oh, and Zigbee. Some modules the worked great. Only work with theirs. Yeah, some worked great, some didn't. So then I found like the they had these special leak detectors that were iris only and they were trying to get in the thing so they were like 9.99 each when generally one will cost you about 40 or 50 but they worked great on open z-wave so i was like great so iris was mostly for me to buying uh modules i then migrated to samsung smart things which quite a few people did um and i stayed there for a while outages plagued it and having to do all of my work from my phone or from a tablet and not having a web interface drove me nuts there is some advanced stuff you can do on web um but it was it was almost like too it, it basically forces you in a box, like, do what we want you to do with your automation. It wasn't a robust enough, wasn't open enough for me. Uh, I gave Open Hub a try next, and it was great, but it wasn't quite polished enough. And then I went to Hubitat, which Hubitat, Hubitat, everyone says it different. Um, they're, by and large, pretty solid, actually. And I still use Hubitat to this day just to talk to Z-Wave and Zigbee devices. Um, the trouble I ran into is their integrations with external stuff is not very great, and it's all custom coding stuff, which is great. I do like the custom work myself. But Hubitat hasn't been super friendly with their developer community, and a lot of developers have written nice integrations and then pulled them because they got burned. And so I was watching integrations pop off of it, which was really painful. And so then I finally came to the conclusion that no platform does it all, at all. You will never find one that does everything, and it's all the magic that you're going to do is to find one platform to kind of glue everything together. And that's how I arrived on Home Assistant. Home Assistant is basically my glue for everything. And this is where I'm at now. I actually have Blue Iris for my cameras. Blue Iris users, a few of those. Yep. That's um, why we run at the hacker space. Great. Blue Iris. Um, I've gotten a Bode security system. And I'm, like, I'm not like selling a Bode or anything. It's just I wanted to have, when it comes to a security system based on my X10 experience and the life I live there, I wanted my security system to kind of be standalone and segmented away from automation. But I still want them to talk, if that makes sense. And so I've gotten a both security system. It's Z-Wave as well, so I've got two Z-Wave networks running at the same house. It's all right. Uh, they don't fight each other. Range is fine, all that stuff. The only reason I'm a real fan of a boat is they do ad hoc monitoring. You don't have to pay for like a, a year commitment. You can actually just pay for a week. If you want to have your house monitored for a week while you're on vacation, you can do 10 bucks and they'll watch your house for a week. Kind of, kind of a cool thing. And then Hubitat's doing my Z-Wave and Zigbee radio stuff. Uh, so that's where I'm at now. Um, why? And then my next kind of mantra with home automation is after going the rounds with, with, with smart things, I said, I don't want my home automation to depend on an online platform. I don't want to live there because sure enough, Insteon, not too long ago, went dark. Everyone who was in the ecosystem, it went dark and they were done. 
and that happens. And I did not want to be like, great, now I get to do the whole, let's rip everything out, let's read it again. I want to be able to say, all my automations, all of my stuff that I do to turn lights on, to control the house, needs to stay local and stay in my environment. I'm happy with cloud connectors too, like if I want to like increase my functionality, but they can't be the core function of my house. So like door locks, lights, sensors, those need to stay local. Uh, Wink was plagued by outage as well. They're another example of that. Um, this is probably the saddest update I've ever seen. One week later, Wink, one week later, Wink is still down. Oh my gosh. Like a whole week of downtime. I just feel bad for all the folks that got excited and sold this to like their cohabitants and say, hey, we're gonna have this automation, it's gonna be great. And be like, it doesn't work and out it would go. So I did, this is where I was gonna actually have the holy war of Z-Wave versus Zigbee versus Hardwired versus Wi-Fi. But I'm really gonna be in the camp of why not both or all. Um, just not Wi-Fi. Zigbee and, and uh, Z-Wave? I have, I have Zigbee and Z-Wave in the same house. Now, it makes sense to kind of go all in on one of them because they're mesh network technologies, right? So why not make your, net, your mesh network as powerful, pow, powerful as you can on one platform? But sometimes you find a Zigbee bulb that's $8 and you have to buy 20 of them. Just sometimes that happens. So then I'm like, guess I'm running Zigbee. <laughs> that's how I got into Zigbee. Um, they don't interfere with each other. They're on different frequencies. We could sit and argue which is better. I don't think it matters. Just double down on one to get a strong network, and then once you want to start expanding, go ahead. Um, Wi-Fi, I'm going to say no, because most of those Wi-Fi solutions don't talk locally. I'm just, they just don't. Um, I actually don't even know of anything that you can, uh, maybe there's some like... You have to hack things. Yeah, you'd have to hack it. You either build it yourself as a Wi-Fi device, or you hack something to get it local integrations most of the time. Yeah, and I just didn't want to depend on cloud platforms. So like so. somebody earlier before the class mentioned Tasmodo, mm -hmm. or Tasmoda, I don't remember, but it's basically hacking devices so you can run your own custom firmware which does local control over Wi-Fi. Right. But you have to hack it. Yeah. And I kind of like the idea of buying something that, that should work and if it doesn't work, take it back. Um, okay, slides are boring, let's go. So one thing I've always said is when I say, hey guys, let's do automation, let's tear into it. They're like, it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's too much work. So my goal, and this might be a lofty goal, and if this fails, I apologize, but it's going to be fun. We're going to build an entire smart home in this room. Live. <laughs> Pray to the demo gods. Let's go. Okay, we're going to base on Home Assistant. Um, now, since based on previous classes, especially the one that Bash did, um, I'm going to choose Proxmox for my hypervisor this time, just because it's great. Um, one thing I'm going to say is I'm going to run this as a fat VM. I'm not going to run it as a container. The reason why is things get super weird when I'm going to try to pass a USB dongle to Doc Z-Wave into a container and then maybe into another container if I go from LXC to Docker. That gets real funky and I don't want this to be a class on how can we pass USB. So we're going to do a fat VM if that's cool. Um, for anyone that's a Hyper-V fan, USB pass-through Hyper-V is not a thing to my knowledge um, in my research. So don't do it on Hyper-V. But VMware, sure, um, pick your favorite platform. We're gonna do Proxmox, that's what we're in. Now, installing it, thanks to the wonderful people of the internet, I'm gonna show you this awesomeness right here. We've got these friends on the internet that say, hey, here's the installation guide. Now, can you run this on Raspberry Pi? Absolutely you can. I ran one on a Pi 3, it was okay. When I was just doing basic Z-Wave, just basic stuff, it was just fine. When I started pulling in cameras, integrations, third-party stuff, it bogged down quite a bit, and the and the UI was very unresponsive. Probably better with a Pi Zero, uh, not Zero Pi Four, with the higher RAM, you'd probably be fine. Just that's what I I didn't have a three, and then I thought, oh, I'll just pop down and pick up a Pi Four. <laughs> not today. Good luck buying them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can do it on Android, Asus, Tinkerbell, generic. You can actually just run it on Windows, flat, Mac OS, Linux. Like just run it whatever you want. It'll pretty much run on anything. Now, this is some hotness, and I'll distribute these links. I don't know, how do you normally distribute links and information? Do we Discord. do it? Discord? Okay, yeah. we'll put this on the Discord. This fine folk, whoever they are, thank you, kind internet stranger, has beautiful instructions for installing Home Assistant OS on Proxmox 7. This first step is installing Proxmox, getting all ready. I've already configured Proxmox, and I've updated it um, using the community re repos. Um, thanks to Bash's talk, I learned how to do that. <laughs> I just ran it unupdated for like six months. I'm like, oh, oh I can fix that. <laughs> now, installing Home Assistant, this fine folk gave us a one-liner. So we are literally just going to shove that in there. This will create a new Home Assistant USVM. Proceed, yes, please. 
So you can either do an advanced setup or we're just gonna do the default settings. So it's just gonna use 7.6. It's gonna give the VMID 101, that's the next one of my Proxmox, two of the CPUs, four gigs of RAM. It's gonna bridge the ethernet interface, no VLAN tags. And it's gonna go ahead and pull the latest version down and deploy. Oh my gosh, this guy is amazing. Uh -huh. Whoever wrote this. Whoever wrote this is wonderful. <laughs> So Home Assistant's a little interesting. Normally you'll have like an installer or something. They just create a, they just have a disk image. So they have just a raw disk image that you have to convert to your favorite system. And I was running into trouble trying to like import that into Proxmox and get it to like go from the format he had or they have into what I wanted. And then I found the script and I'm like, okay, I can run one line. So, to curl. I'm hyped to bash. Yeah, it's like, just go ahead and get that form. So if we hop over to Proxmox, that's the old one. Uh, here we are. Not quite there yet. And this is all running, just so you know my hardware we're running on. This is on Intel NUC. Um, it's, I think, a 5th gen I, uh, fifth gen Intel NUC. Not super powerful, um, but it works. I run mine on an HP EC200A. If anyone has ever seen any of my other works in home labs or whatever, it's my new favorite tiny hypervisor. It's a Xeon D 1518. I've got 64 gigs of RAM in mine, and it sips a delicious 18 watts. Wow. So eight cores, t as much RAM as you can fit in two slots. Um, it, it's fantastic. That's why I run mine on at home. And I will jump to my home setup because I've done some of those integrations, those cloud connectors that I don't want to like redo in this class. So please don't spy on my cameras because they are there. Or if you do spy, just forget what you see. How's that? So if we go back Stop to really Proxmox, bodies. there we go. VM 101 is now running. Check out the console, and it's booting up. So this is a fully functioning home assistant, ran from one line. Proxmox is amazing. Isn't it great? I dare you do that with the ASXi. Right. <laughs> now, here's the best part for anyone. So I'm sure we have some CLI junkies that love it. I'm, I'm one of you, it's great. Some people don't want to. Guess what? You never need this. You don't have to do anything. It's all, all via their interface, which is fantastic. All right, it gave it an address of 99.139. And can we just say the first hurdle of the lab went on. <laughs> I'm gonna jinx it. I know. <laughs> Bring it, demo gods. All right, we're preparing home assistant. Uh, so this, this can take 20 minutes. It won't. Let's go home. On Raspberry Pi, yes, this will take 20 minutes. It may take 30. You may think it failed, unplug, redeploy, and try again. And then you just had to wait 45. But that's a story for another day. I feel like you already told it. Mm -hmm. That's true. I guess I just told the story. Cool. So while this is building, I want to talk about some of the goodies I bought, brought. Okay, so I have a Roku, just a regular run-of-the-mill $19 from Best Buy Roku. Um, it's the cheapest HD one. It's wireless, no wired. Like, they don't make a cheaper version of it. So I got that. I've got this lovely IP camera right here, straight from our friends at AliExpress. Um, this will send images to China. I'm not joking. I actually did a full talk on that, on how these cameras were making random UDP high requests, or UDP high port requests to AliExpress servers. I don't know what it was. We're all doxxed. Yeah, we have no idea what they are. So luckily, when I plug this in, it's going to be pointing at that wall. Sorry, not going to keep that too interesting. Um, do I use these in my home? All the place. I use these everywhere. Do you know what I do? I segment them off on their own little VLAN, and they don't get to talk to the internet. Ever. And I've got one tiny firewall hole for my NVR to go in and pull that RTSP stream, and that's the only thing that can talk to that subnet. So, do I take, care, do I take advantage of cheap $19 cameras? Yes. Now, the reason why is, if you look at this, I mean, there's an Ethernet port on there, um, it's actually got an SD card reader, it's a 1080 sensor, there's PPC. more than hmm? full yeah. PTZ. Yeah, full PTZ. There is more than ten to twenty dollars of tech in this device, right? So the product being purchased is you when you buy one of these. So subscribe for the Chinese government. Yeah, segment these off. Don't let them talk to the internet. They're great. I have them all over my house. Don't use their cloud. This Don't use their cloud. Put it all over your house. When it says please download our app, run, <laughs> run the other way as fast as you can. Okay, great. Home Assistant is built. I am Clipper, and typing is hard. My password is 801labs because I am guarantee I'm gonna forget it, so you're gonna remind me, thank you so much. Because if I use one of my real passwords, inadvertently I'm gonna type it in a clear text and then I have to go change one password because it's a password ball, but whatever. Okay, 
Um, name of this thing, we're going to call this the Hackerspace, will be the name of this one. Our time zone, we are lovely here in Denver. Lovely. Um, elevation in meter, does anyone know that off the top of their head? Um, it's like 4,500 feet. Yeah. You can switch to Imperial right there, right? That uh, that's you that's for else. Fahrenheit, pounds. No, it's still meters. Um, <laughs> that's a fun UI thing. 1,288. <laughs> yep. Thank you. And our currency is US dollars. Now, the reason they have that in there is you can actually put clamps around your mains in your power, and you can actually check your power usage over time. If you don't like that idea, you can actually sniff it right over the air if you've got one of the new smart that Rocky Mountain Power is putting in. And Home Assistant does have an integration for that. And some of the old ones you can sniff too. Okay, cool. What kind of, what do you need to receive that? RTL, STR. Yeah. So an STR, okay. And there's yeah. a GitHub repo that you can... And actually, the, got it done for you. and the integration for this is literally like, oh, you want to do that? Great, on. And, it'll <laughs> and you can detect your radio, and it'll just start pulling so it. Do you see like all your neighbors you too? Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know who it is. So what you do is you wait till someone leaves and watch their power uses go down, and then you wait till they come back and like, oh, it's that neighbor. Okay, address. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically like the weirdest game of like, remember the Guess Who game where you flip down like the little faces, like the board game? It's like, okay, who's not using power? All right. The way I did mine. Can you use a vacuum totally in the morning? morning. <laughs> the way what I did, I waited to about 2 a.m. and then plugged my car charger in. I said, here we go. This one's me. <laughs> cool. So Home Assistant already um, did a multicast out to my little local network and found some integrations right now. So now you're thinking, wow, Clipper, this is super hard to integrate. Well, let me show you how hard it is to integrate. Do I want to set up Google Cast? Yes. Oh, look, it found my Google Home Mini. That's right here, and it is muted. It's hardware muted um, because reasons. Muted. It's got an actual physical yeah, switch. switch on. Oh, okay. um, a lot of those smart devices say, oh, push our mute, like toggle on, 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 off button, right? Do you trust it? I don't know. Have I opened it up to desolder it? No, I haven't, but I'm hoping that the Hello, hardware Google. mute. Yeah, it's probably listening to us. I'm sorry. I introduced it. Okay. Unlike all of the phones in our pockets. Phones, watches, <laughs> whatever we got, right? Okay. Um, there's a weird home assistant thing that I'll show you. It, it asks you to always put things in areas, and that makes sense for organization and for building dashboards and all that good stuff. So if I'm going to add a new area, I'm going to actually call this area the classroom. You're going to do classroom and hit add, and then you're going to go here and be like, oh, there's the classroom. In previous versions, you could add those as many times as you want. It would never show up on that list. It was a bug. And so I literally, if the first time I set it up, I had 30 offices because I could have been like, office, office. You did it 30 times. Yeah. Well, not 30. <laughs> That's an exaggeration. I had more than three, more than three. So there's What's that. Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So that's set up. Oh, Roku Traveler. Let's set up Roku. And that's in the classroom. Finish. Okay, those are set up. That's literally how hard those integrations were. Um, if you go to more, um, these are all the integrations. We're going to dive into this in just a bit, but I'm just going to click finish there for now and let it build the first setup. Okay, so we have the Roku Traveler right here, and we have a Google Home Mini. Those are the two devices. Now, not only are they, um, can I control them? I can also just see what they're playing. So does anyone have little ones in the house or whatever? If you're concerned about what they're watching late at night, you can actually use Home Assistant to tie into whatever device they have in their rooms, and it'll tell you what they're watching and keep that history in case you want to. Um, not a use case for me because I live alone, and if I can't remember what I watched, there's probably another reason for it. Um, does it actually give you uh, screen captures of what they're watching or just the no, metadata? Just the metadata, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but what's really cool is I can actually browse media and I can start casting media to it right now if I wanted to. Or this is, here we go. Here goes out for live demo. Oh, that doesn't have sound speakers on it, does it? No. Really? No, those TVs don't have speakers on it. Uh -huh. If that had speakers, you'd all be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. We'll do it this way. So that's on the Google Home right there, right? <laughs> now that's going to come into play in a little bit. Um, I just want to show you that that's right out of the box. That's working just fine and dandy. Um, that was really fast response time too. That's what's awesome is how fast because it's sending it locally. It's not bouncing out off the cloud. So that's talking locally to that device. So we can literally go and 
we're gonna go back to that browser and do the text to speech. Like, I'm gonna click it. Quarter of a second, maybe. Almost instantly. Can you turn the volume up when you do that? Um, I don't. Ooh, let's see if I can do it from here. I like went to instantly touch it, right? Oh, sure can. There you go. All the way. Well, here we go. <laughs> Volume. So, pretty quick and responsive. Now, I kind of want this to this presentation or this class or whatever we're going to call this to be kind of a, a cafe style, cafeteria style. Take what you like, leave what you don't, right? One of my favorite uses for these Google Home speakers, this is my announcement. This is my announcement system. So, I've got door and window sensors around the house. Door opens. I've got a text to speech that says, front door just opened. I close that. Front door secured. Now, I'm gonna go back to the use case where you've got little ones at home when they start getting into high school and start wanting to sneak out. That window opens. There you go, you now know. Now, you can create Google Cast groups and it will actually detect those groups within Home Assistant. So if you wanted to group multiple of these together and just do a whole house broadcast of that and really shame someone for sneaking out of their house, you can do that. <laughs> that would be awkward, but you could. Um, the history on these, um, it's pretty cool. Like the actual data you can get out of this is that's turned off, changed to idle, playing something. So you can actually go back and, and debug your automations and stuff based on just this robust set of, um, of reporting they give you right here. Okay, so we've got a Roku and we've got a Google Home Mini. Let's do the camera. And I'm going to keep this thing pointed over here behind everything so we're not sneaky on. It's going to go on. YouTube anyways. Yeah. It's gonna suddenly just tilt around slowly. Oh it is it does boot itself up and do that. Well it, after the boot it's just gonna start panning. Yeah there we go. Alright, we're gonna fire this camera up. Now could I have had this camera already plugged in and going? Sure I could, but I wanna show there's no aces up the sleeves and I'm wearing sleeves. And do we have a link light bash? Can you see that? Um not yet. Oh don't fail me, cheap nineteen dollar technology. Maybe stay on target. Come on. How about you move to the next one and okay. work on getting this working? I think it's a power issue. So okay. if you throw in something USB, something that's not data, <laughs> just power. Cool. Um, let's do Z Wave. Let's do Z Wave. Um, I've got. How about this right here? Yeah, that should work. Okay, so let's do Z-Wave. So inside, we've, I've got a Z-Wave stick, and I'm not gonna unplug it because I don't wanna have to boot Proxmox up so it detects again, but trust me, I have a Z-Wave stick in this device. I'll pass it around later if you want to prove it, but I do have one. Um, I'm not gonna go through the effort of going through and trying to find which device it is, so I'm just gonna pass all the USBs through because this box isn't doing anything else. Um, is that Cradle Point yours? It is. Um, it's my I travel don't... router. Are you going to hate on it or are you going to love on it? You can do either. I use, I'm, so, cellular travel router. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just got one. Oh, cool. Good. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Cradle Open. Point. Yeah, so work was, I was setting up too many, checking too many people's VPN configurations at work on my phone. Oh, okay. And I told work, either buy, start paying me my data plan or buy me this. And now I have one. Nice, yeah. So this this is a cradle point. This is one of their older models. This is an IBR 900. Um, has anyone ever heard of Visible Wireless? They're Verizon. They're basically on Verizon's network. Twenty five dollars a month, unlimited everything is what they are. Um, this is basically the last one that supports that particular SIM and that setup. So that's why I have it. So I always have just a standby cellular with it. And then when I go to hotels or wherever I go, I try to use theirs first. And if I failed at cellular, I do. That's what I do. And if we ever want, someday we need to have like a, a go bag kit talk here. Everyone brings like their go bags of what they take with them everywhere because I think it'd be interesting. Vacation tech? Yeah. Like, like literally, here's mine. You have, wait, what's the, it's like okay. a little red medicine. No, no, we'll get into it later. Look, everyone. Okay, we'll get into it later. 
No, I can pretty much connect anything to anything if I had to. Okay, I'm going to reboot Home Assistant just so I can pick up that USB real quick. Um, super fast, it's lightning, lightning quick to do it. And hardware, reboot host. This might be jumping the gun, but how you can, uh, what do you do when you, um, with troublesome smart things? So I've got uh, a pair of Honeywell smart thermostats, okay. which are required to register through their website before you get a token, and then they broadcast their um, broadcast uh, their own network, log into the network with your phone, mm -hmm. and then So manual configuration hell. Mm -hmm. Uh, where's the button for manual configuration hell? So that is, so likely what, so can you control them locally? Like if you send a command to them, does it stay on your network or does it go out to their cloud and back down? I believe it goes out to their cloud. And so down. we'll have to use an integration and I bet there is one. Yes, but we, they've got Alexa and Google um, Home. So let's see if this box is back up. It should be soon. Live demos are scary. Why do I do this? Because it's fun. It is. I love to live on the edge. You learn a lot. Um, that camera's working now. Oh, good. Thank you. Yep. So once this box is back, once my Proxmox is happy again, we can jump back in. So is there a better Z-Wave stick than others? So that's a great question. Um, I Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. So if the question is, is there a better Z-Wave stick than others? Um, there are uh, you want to basically buy as new as you can because they keep updating to like have secure protocols on them and so if you go and grab like the the discount like gen 1 sticks you're going to have a bad time uh, this is a zoos which is my least favorite of the z-wave companies but it is a, a zoos um, it works okay inside of home assistant home assistant documentation is also lovely um yeah go ahead um is there a way to update the firmware on the Z-Wave or the Zigbee radios to get the newer uh, security functions? Depends on the radio. Okay. Some are open, they let you do that. Some it's like, yeah, buy a new one. Okay. Um, if you click, if you go to Home Assistant and look for the Z-Wave JS, um, these are the supported dongles that they that they support. Um, mine is the Zoo Z S2 Stick 700. That's what I have right there. But they also do have Z-Wave hats for Raspberry Pis if you want to do a hat. Is that what they're called? The little things that yeah. stick on the, the pins? Hats. Cool. Yay, we're back. 801 Labs. <laughs> Your username is Clifford. Ah, oh, thank you. I knew it would do it. I knew it would happen. All right, so if we go to settings and we go to device and service integrations, and my Z-Wave stick did not show up, so that's unfortunate. So we're going to do the camera first. Okay, cool, camera. So we can just do a generic camera feed. If you have Blue Iris or some other NVR, you can do that, but I'm just gonna run it all through here so there's nothing else to buy. Um, we're gonna see which IP that we just picked up on that guy. Now you're gonna, no, no, this one actually, oh, I don't know what this one, I don't, oh. it's one of them. There we go. Um, one thing to note is a lot of these integrations talk to straight IP to these devices. So you're gonna probably wanna create specific IoT networks on your home network and then do reservations, DHCP reservations on those. Don't try to like set the IPs on these yourself because you're gonna hate yourself. Um, because every single one of these firmware is different. Some of them work great, some don't work great. Some want used to IE6. It's a whole lovely thing. Um, Ethernet port, let's see, DSP server, okay, so IP camera picked up 99.115. That was the hard way to do it. Now, I'll show you my favorite tool. If your camera talks ONVIF, ONVIF device manager. Click on yes, sends out a quick scan, hey, there it is. So if you have a bunch of cameras you want to get set up quick, you can use this ONVIF uh, device manager, it's out on SourceForge, it's free, um, and it'll go through sweep across your whole subnet and say, hey, here's, here's all your cameras. Now, I have mentioned a few times that it's good to segment and, and get these cameras on their own. How do you do this? Two ways. One, put your laptop in the danger zone and get on the subnet with them. Or uh, use what's called an Avahi reflector. That's A-V-A-H-I. It's a daemon that, that runs on several Linux boxes. And it'll actually bridge those multicast domains. So if you wanted to just swing those over, don't leave it on forever, but it's okay to, on a small enough network, clip it on, be able to broadcast out, find it, and bye. 
So here is our live video, and you're going to say, why are you looking at live video on this tool? Because it gives me the RTSP stream for it right there that I'm just going to copy pasta. So I'm going to go over here and go back to home automation. Do, 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 do. And here's the stream source. Now, you're going to hate me, and this isn't secure. I get it, but this is a demo. I'm going to put the username and password in the, stream, in the URL. Please don't hate me, but I'm doing it. Uh, don't you need, like, a... Missed that. Thank you. And submit. Frame rate 2 hertz? What does that mean? So I'm literally only pulling 2 frames per second on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a camera. Okay, this makes sense. Yeah, right. A lot of people, and I've never understood this, like, some people that do their camera systems, like, for surveillance, are like, 30 FPS, 60 FPS. I'm like... It's surveillance cameras. We're not shooting like Dunkirk here. Like, <laughs> I've never understood that. Like, and they'll get on the forums for like Blue Iris and like, I'm just having a really hard time capturing all those frame rates. Like, I've got 24 cameras that are 4K and I'm pulling 30 frames a second. I'm like, mm hmm. Yes, <laughs> that's painful. Until you put a GPU in and then those problems kind of go away. But, so now I've got a camera, which is cool. We're going to go back to our overview. Your overview is basically your everything goes in this like the overview one if you go and like change this you lose the overview this is every device used to get dumped here now while it's setting up that's a great thing but when you're like having it going it's a bad thing now i'm going to tell you why it's a bad thing is because the overview is viewable by all users on home assistant every single person can see this so in the event that you've got um cheap amazon fire tablets bolted to your walls and your home automation control panel is one of the devices, an attacker could literally walk in, go to your overview and be like, disarm, because it's just a device. So when you're done, get rid of your overview. That's my pro tip. And as you can see, we have a camera right there, all going through home assistant, nothing else is used. Now, let's see. Oh, there, there it's coming. There it is, little delay, right? A lot of delay. Yeah. More delay than expected. Okay. But now I've got a camera and I've got a Roku. Do you think? No way. Stay on target. Come on. Come on, demo gods. Oh, boom goes the dynamite. <laughs> That's cool. So, pretty well not lying, it's going to probably delay too, again, sorry folks. Don't make me a liar. Don't make me a liar. Apparently you get still images for sure. So the attacker can get in, disarm, and then oh. get out. Did it come? Yep. We okay. got it. Oh, yeah. There it is! Hey! A little delay. Real time, it is not. But, now, I hope I've opened your minds with that idea of like, okay, I just pushed a camera feed through Home Assistant to this. How many people have a doorbell in their house? Everyone has a doorbell in their house, <laughs> a right? A normal doorbell? A normal doorbell. Regular yeah. ding-dong doorbell. I and actually, technically, I do. Yeah, right? A lot of people go, I bought a ring. There are very um, various complications I have internally over ring doorbells, right? Well, why can't you just put a cheap Wi-Fi IP camera out there, re push that button to a Z-Wave button or a relay, and then say, when that button gets pushed, throw this out on every TV I have. That's exactly what I'm doing. So when someone rings the doorbell, my t show gets interrupted, and it's a little bit quicker than this lab setup, but I actually get a live feed from my porch to see who's at my door. Super cool when I'm just hanging out, watching TV, not doing anything. Super annoying when I'm playing a game. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hey, guys, my pizza arrived. Yeah, right. What you're saying is that when you're playing a game, we need to go to your house and just, start, just ring the doorbell. Just start ringing that doorbell <laughs> as many times as you can, right? Now... Wait a second. We need to. We were gonna play some games at some point. Oh, we do. <laughs> there we go. And and so you're gonna see like making these aut automations is an iterative process because what seems like an awesome idea at the time, you're gonna be like, oh, there are holes in my logic. That is one of them. Um, if you tie this into like a bigger uh, ecosystem, like a Blue Iris or some other NVR. Um, you can actually do like camera cycles and cycle through different cameras. So if you want to have a really cool like 90s style police like 
blotter to like not blotter police like surveillance station to watch camera cycle through totally can you don't have to set up a monitor and tv over where your nvr is you can cast that over anywhere you want um yeah you're going to choose some wi-fi cycles but again it's like who cares if it's not real time real time if, if it's 10 15 seconds delayed that's probably okay so yeah cool that's awesome so that's cameras now what else do we have okay Let's try to get the Z-Wave working. It didn't pick up my Z-Wave stick, which has me a little concerned, to be honest, because it should have picked it up. Let's see if it can see it. Z-Wave's is... So in your house, do you use a Z-Wave stick or a hub? So I'm using a Hubitat, which is actually a standalone hub, but then I'm using integration and Home Assistant to control it. Gotcha. So my Home Assistant tells Hubitat to talk to my Z-Wave. Few reasons I did that. Number one, I didn't want to have to buy a Z-Wave and a Zigbee stick, um, and Hubitat supports both. Two, I didn't want to go unpair every device again. <laughs> and so it's like, well, I could buy new sticks and sell the Hubitat or, um, or not. Three, if you want to go into integrations with like Home Assistant, if you want to do voice control with Home Assistant or Alexa, it's much easier to integrate Hubitat directly than to go through Home Assistant. Home Assistant requires you either to pay for their their cloud service, which is very reasonable, it's not super expensive, or you have to do port forwarding and get an API token from Google, stuff like that. Um, Hubitat has it naturally, so I just stuck with that um, for that reason. Oh, not that, uh, that's not my reason for me, but some people do it that way. Is your coverage just fine on Hubitat? Yeah, yeah, it's just fine. I've got mine down in my mechanical, oh, is the coverage fine on the Hubitat was the question. Mine's down in my basement in my mechanical room with all my other equipment. And since it's a mesh networking, I just made sure to put some good solid in-wall stuff that are repeaters, like switches that go in the walls, and I can repeat up just fine. I think your max is like on Z-Wave is what? 253 nodes on the uh, single... What frequency is Z-Wave? Z-Wave is four... Frequency of Z-Wave. It's four something. Interesting. Nope, 908. 908.42. Nine. 9. Okay, so that's that uh, decent penetration. Zigbee is 2.4. So if anyone's in the Zigbee world, Zigbee's 2.4, if you still have 2.4 networks, you can fight it. Or if your microwave revs up, sometimes that'll fight it. I had the weirdest thing, my, my Zigbee network would go nuts every time the microwave turned on. Got a new microwave in one way, but... Cool. Okay, Z-Wave is not happy with me. There's our first not loveliness. I'm gonna switch ports on this. So for <clears throat> voice control and stuff, what about Almond? Almond, know. yeah. Super cool tech, you can run it locally. Okay. Yeah, you can do almond stuff locally, so it doesn't have to go out to a cloud. Um, the the setup isn't as easy as the little click button that I showed you. It's a little bit more in depth, but super cool. Um, I want to get into that. I I have a hard time leaving them like listening, <laughs> so it's like it's hard. I almost want um, like the C three PO style from uh, Star Wars and just like carry around like a microphone. But that would be super nerdy, but I think it, I think I could pull it off. You mean like your cell phone where you click and hold the home button and it does the same thing? Yeah, but I want a, like, I want a cylinder, like a gold cylinder that'd be like, <laughs> 3PO! You know, that, like, that'd be awesome. Use the little Walkman from Home Alone. I bet we could make one, you guys. I bet we could. It wouldn't be that hard. It's just a Bluetooth microphone. It's all we need. I wonder since I did a reboot instead of a all the way off and on, it didn't pick that up. I'm gonna shut it off all the way off and shut it off through shut it off through home assistant. And yeah. Turn it back on through Proxbox. Yeah, that's the idea. Where is there it is? That's not the right section. System hardware shut down host shut down. So I do have some other toys. This is an Aon. Or is this an Aotech? Yeah, this is an Aon Aon Labs. This is their single module. That's just a relay on off. The cool thing about this is this thing's stable up to 15 amps. So I actually had a Chevy Volt for several years. I charged my Chevy Volt through this actual unit on a 110. Mm. For three years, I did it. It's still working and it works great. The re Why would I do something crazy? Power metering. So I could see how much power the car was charging and I could calculate my cost. That's why I did it. All right. Would I say, would, would the fine folks at Aeon Lab say that's a great use for a case for this? Probably not. <laughs> but a testament of their product, it ran great and it still works. Do yeah. they have some that go up to 20 amps? I've, I haven't seen a 20 amp, but I'm, maybe one of their power strips good. Mm. Yeah, so I got one of those. This is from uh, Monoprice. This is a Z Wave motion sensor. This will do motion, um, temperature, humidity. Um, and Lux. 
Which, if someone could explain lux to me sometime, and not to say well, it's how much light there is, but actually tell me what the numbers mean, please do, because I can't figure it out. Because every sensor reads it differently, and some people say, lux of 100 is the power of the sun, and then others say, lux 100 is a USB light. I'm like, I don't know. Like, I can't figure that out. So, if someone knows, please explain it to me. It was invented by Lux infomercial USB. You see how those USB they, devices went black. from orange to black? Yeah, that's yeah. probably that what it means. That uh, means Proxmox applied the settings. So. Yeah. Cool. So Orange means like this will change at the next boot. Oh, cool. So that's why. Cool. We're going to use Z-Way working. So why do I like these guys and why do I care about humidity? You might think that's a dumb thing to care about. Um, these go in my bathrooms. Now, the reason these go in my bathrooms is, A, I want the lights to turn on when I walk in because... Why do I need to like turn a light on? I just walk in and have the light come on. Two, if the humidity rises too high because of my shower, I want my fan to turn on. And when the humidity drops, turn that fan back off for me. Like input is, my idea That's is basically, awesome. thank you. Uh, my idea is, is, I think Elon said this once, like input is error. And I came to think in home assistant or home automation, that's true. When we have to actually touch our houses, it's, it's wrong. Like we should have our houses think for us. Now my girlfriend on the other hand, hates everything about this. <laughs> like literally I, I used to have two modes I used to have automated mode and then semi-automated mode because she would go nuts because she just walk into a room and the lights turned on for her she's like no I didn't want the lights on I'm like well you walked into a dark room why wouldn't they be on it's like I don't want them on so it, it's a it's a fun battle we play um, so I have the exact same ones and I put them outside of my kids room and when they go to bed it automatically sets it so that they get out of bed and it's not morning time and I get bugged by it so that I know if they're like playing around outside of their room and it's pretty useful. Oh, we've discovered a Z-Way radio, folks. It's going. Okay, this is now this is cool. This add a, this is where you do security keys for secure Z-Wave. If anyone has like a Z-Wave deadbolt or I think some garage openers actually use the secure protocol now. And I think a lot of the actual excuse me, I think a lot of the actual devices are going to the secure protocol. Um and I don't know, and I need to do more research on this, but I think you can actually migrate stuff over by sharing these keys. And I've never done it, though, but I, I think you can. You can. Don't do it. Okay. Just, Just don't repair. Do Just repair. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I've got a Z-Wave deadbolt, which is super fantastic. Um, depending on how... And one thing you have to look at when you're buying Z-Wave devices or Zigbee devices for any... For any um, for any reason or whatever. See what capabilities they have on the radio. Cause some will just be like, hey, I'll let you actuate that lock on or off. Some will say, I'll report my battery. Some will report when the manual, like a human goes in and turns it. So make sure you like kind of look at what they do before you um, do those. Now in, in, in Home Assistant, when you create a lot of things, you're gonna have to put, put them in rooms for organization. One tip that I like is I create one called infrastructure and I just don't put infrastructure on anything. Because the Z-Wave stick itself, I, I don't. it's not going to be in a room. I don't interact with it. So it's in my infrastructure room. And I just don't build any dashboards on um, on those. So we're going to put these all... Huh, so infrastructure showed up on that one, but it's not on those ones. That's funny. That's okay. Okay. Z-Wave. Here we go. So this is all the Z-Wave devices right here. You do add device. And now it's in pairing mode. Here we go. More demos. And I don't even know if I unpaired this from my home. Great, we're gonna learn about Z-Wave exclusion. <laughs> so if we go to, let's see if I can remember where I can find it. It's under Z-Wave, uh, is it configure? Did I do it? And then remove device, start exclusion. Let's see if I can do it. And it was excluded. Now. No, I don't know if people know this. You you realize you can exclude from anything, right? You don't have to exclude it from the device you originally paired it to. What? Yeah, you just put it in exclusion oh. mode and you exclude it from anything. So I just excluded this from my. <laughs> I just excluded this from my home one. To this one, I just put this in exclusion mode to do it. So if someone has physical access, they can take over all your Z-Wave devices. Non-secure ones. Okay. No, even almost all of them. Yeah, almost all of them. Because they always have a reset, like function too. So like if you have a light switch and someone wants to still control your light switch, they just like will hit the button combo to reset it and then they'll pair it to whatever they want. And some combos are actually, get, or some of those are starting to get like the Konami code, like to pair them. It's like up, up, left, left, right, right, up, or whatever, you know. This one's dumb. This one's just one button. Holy smokes, the Z-Wave demo works. <laughs> Holy cow. 
Cool. We just had a Z-Wave device. So now, Sean's pro tip of doing these is do not add every Z-Wave device you have at once. Why? Because you likely have the same model in a few of them. And what you're going to do quickly come to the stunning realization of is I've got 10 GE Jasco light switches that are all paired to my hub that I didn't rename. And so now you get to play everyone's favorite game, turn on and see what light turns on. That's not a fun game. <laughs> now, I would say what I'm going to tell you is I've never made that mistake. The truth is I've done it twice now. <laughs> Literally, I've got burned by it once and I'm like, oh, I'll know better this time. Nope. One at a time, <laughs> slow is smooth, smooth is fast, okay? <laughs> cool, so we are going to rename this guy from Smart Energy Switch to Aeon Labs 1. And the area is in the classroom, and it's enabled. We're going to give that a new name. So if we go to our overview, t overview tab, we now have the classroom. Now, this is all metadata. So they've got a card built in this, in this uh, default view for you, which is just grabbing the the, the data from all these things. Not the controls for them. The controls from this little slider right here, so you'll see it. Uh, can you hear the relay clicking? Yeah. It I is. Can. Oh, wait. I'll prove it's clicking. We have the technology. Sorry, I'm all over the place, everyone. I hope this is making sense to anyone. Okay, we have... I'm not going to point that at you. That'd be mean. Okay, can... Can you tell it's going on? On and off? Yep. Okay, cool. Now, as you can see, this particular device is a smart consumption device, so it will tell us in just a moment what its consum consumption is. This only pulls every, I want to say, 15 to 20 seconds, so it might take it just a bit. And I'm hoping it's pulling enough energy to actually read. So we're just going to leave it on for just a bit. now. Here's where the cool stuff happens. I've showed you kind of tying in some Z-Wave stuff. I've showed you a camera. I've showed you some thing. Let's make some magic now. Now, first, before we get in there, I want to take a brief pause to talk about integrations. Um, so the integrations I've been using so far is just the generic camera, Google Cast, um, the Z-Wave one, Sun, that's just for sun, sunrise, sunset timers, and then the Roku. This stuff's all, all this magic is happening locally in this room. I'm not going up to the cloud for it. Now, there are cloud connectors and I'm okay using cloud connectors as long as it's not like my, my house has to have this to run, right? So anyone, and I hope this is the, this is the audience participation point, throw out some cloud services that you use and let's see if there's a native integration today. Spotify. Spotify. Yes. Ift. IFTT? Yep. Right there. Twitter. Twitter. Uh, that one you're going to have to do custom. Dang it. I didn't want to tweet every time I went to the bathroom. Yeet. <laughs> oh, that one you super off. <laughs> <laughs> what? If, um, if flush equal 15, bash ate Mexican food. There you go. <laughs> and send an email to my doctor that I'll be coming in tomorrow, right? Um, let's just throw out. email? So, like, SMTP? Um, uh, uh, even better. Mailgun. Mailgun. It's got a default mailgun integration, which is super cool. Uh, if anyone, I'm not going to judge you. If you're a Ring customer, that's great. How about Octoprint? Uh, Octoprint, yes. Uh, and how about Sleep IQ? Sleep IQ. So uh, that's uh, Sleep Number? Mm -hmm. Sleep IQ, right there. Uh, Honeywell, just out of chance. Honeywell. Honeywell. Where? Holy shit. There you go. <laughs> what about Steam? Steam. Um, I... Yes. Oh my gosh, this is <laughs> Okay, who has a Steam account we can tie it to? I'm not tying it to mine. <laughs> my Steam wallet's a little expensive um, to throw in front of all of you. Actually, yeah, no. Uh, we'll tie it in. We'll do it. We're doing it. So, Steam. Actually, nah, this is technically a non-profit Let's Steam do it. account. Let's not okay, so it. we're just for funsies, air things. Air for humidifier uh, thing, uh, almond. We talked about almond briefly. Um, Android TV. We've got Android TVs hanging out. Apple TV, Apple iCloud. Asus BERT or WRT. What about PDK? Uh, PDK? Yeah, sure. Nope. Dang it. Uh, what's PDK? Uh, security RFID stuff. Oh, cool. Now, I'm showing you all the stuff that is built in. This is just the built in. You can also tie your GitHub account to it and then start pulling other people's projects into your Home Assistant, which expands us even more. So we can search for some of those. I've got that tied in at home and we can check that out. But literally, if I'm just scrolling, look how many there are with just me scrolling. This is all built in. 
Uh, HomeKit, any Apple users, if you want to do HomeKit, you can actually control all your stuff from your watch, if you want. What about Enphase, E-N-P-H-A-S-E? E-N. Enphase? They showed up even though Enphase you smelled controller. it. Sick. Solar controller. Solar controller, right. Uh, who runs a pie hole at home? Pie hole, right there. So you can actually see which ads are blocked. The coolest thing for it, though, is you can temporarily disable it. And so if you're like, oh crap, I have to get an affiliate link, pie hole off on my watch, do it, back on. That's cool. That's so cool. This is the magic, and this There's is literally... There's also an app called Flutter Hole yeah. that allows you to control it, and it can do like a five minute off. Yeah, yeah. Back on. Yeah. Yeah. So this that's is what, been my problem with Pi Hole, because it's that one website. Uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, if you want to buy his Xiaomi stuff, Ochre Doker, Xbox. WLED. Uh, yeah, WLED right there. Uh, with things, it doesn't have a smart scale. You can have your home remind you that you're getting fatter every day if you want. <laughs> you could put it on a dashboard and every day say, yep, I'm getting fatter. My home told me. WLED is those lamps that we built. Uh, ways travel time. You can have a dashboard that says how long is it going to take you to get to work. Now, the beauty is, now you're thinking now, I can see all of your minds racing and I love this. I love how everyone's getting excited about this. The beauty is, after you do things manually a few times, like, oh, check my travel time, you go, wait a minute. My house knows I woke up because the light turned on. So why not when this light turns on, let's tell that to display on the display in my bedroom. Pop out my travel time. Or when the garage door opens, check that tablet on the way to the door for the travel time. Right? So now, the siren goes off every time I'm late. You could do that. Uh, Vera, the Ace Run Vera, that's kind of cool. It's still in there. UPNP. Um, if anyone's running Unify stuff, you can pull your Unify information if you're into that. Oh, so you're saying that when my cell phone connects to the Wi-Fi network, because it sees Unify, it sees I get it, make a DHCP lease. Yes. There is also a plugin for PFSense or OpenSense, if you're into those. Ooh. And so when you when you hook onto your Wi-Fi, your DHCP lease to your phone that just got updated tells your house your home. That means you don't have to geofence. And that's what I like a lot. Because I don't like geofencing because you're running GPS on your phone all the time. And that's super annoying. But I just hooked onto my home Wi-Fi. It knows I'm here. And one thing to note is um, a lot of the smart devices you can buy at Walmart or Home Depot or anything else are too young branded. Like, they'll have their own apps, but it's all using Tuya's back end. Sure. So you can do Tuya on there, it looks like. Yeah, Tattoo Leaf, if you're, if you like Spike Stats, um, a Tesla wall connector, I've got one of those, and it just makes me feel sad of watching oh, the power go. I wonder what the tile does. Is mm. Beehive on there? Uh, like the hypervisor, Beehive? No, 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 like the sprinkling system. B-H-Y-V-E. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that one. Uh, it might so be a, Oh, I'm sorry. B-H. Mm, oh. I know Ratio is. It's okay. uh, BH. Just oh, did I mess that up? Yeah. BH. Oh. Okay. So, it might be a custom one, and we'll check the custom ones here in a bit. So, all of this stuff, I hope, like, and I can see it in all your faces. You're all sitting there going, what on earth can I automate? <laughs> now, the cool stuff is they've made it very, very approachable, the automation. Like, a lot of stuff um, previously with, like, Vera was Lua script, or, or is code? It was Lua script, I guess it would be. Um, and, and that's not very approachable for a lot of folks. I have my, my folks, my, my parents run this too, and we all run these same platforms, and my dad's able to automate this stuff. And he's a technical fella, but he doesn't want to write code. He wants to be able to grab an integration for the kind of solutions he buys and tie them all together, and this is literally perfect. So pick yourself up a NUC for cheap and tie it in. So. Well, can you tie it with Alexa stuff too? Alexa? Like uh, Amazon? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can. It's so the default way they do it is you have to sign up for their bridge, their cloud bridge system. Um, it's not expensive. It's a pretty reasonable cost. But honestly, five I just a month, right? yeah, it, five it, a month. it's five a month. It's pretty reasonable cost. But if you're doing a lot of a little bit of Alexa stuff, like you just do IFTT because Alexa talks IFTT just fine and do it to here if you want to do it for free. Um, that's why I have my Hubitat if I wanted to. If, that's why people ought to keep the Hubitat is if they want to tie into that Alexa and Home Assistant. So let's talk. Um, Let's talk automations. And automations is where things get exciting. Um, and first off, I want to I want to kind of point out the different features you have here because a lot of people what they'll do is they'll think automation. Oh, let's just create one right now and make them ad hoc. It's actually better if you set up scenes, scripts, and blueprints because you're going to reuse that stuff. So, for example, let's say I've got lights that I want to turn on at night. Uh, my ex exterior lights on my house and and some my guiding lights in in the house so I can like get from room to room without being blind. 
you would think, let's just create an automation for them. What you'll end up doing is you'll create all these automations that say, turn on eight lights, turn on eight lights, turn on eight lights, versus I'll create a scene, which is night lights. And so then when I call those scenes, I just call a scene versus having to go through and do that over and over and over again. That way you can add new things to the scene really easily. Yes. And not have to update them all. Basically, you're using a function instead of uh, writing it out yourself. So we're going to create a scene real quick. And the scene is going to be, oh, let's pair that other device. I've got another device there. I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to try it. Um, Z-Wave, device, add device. Let's see if this works. I think it's three on this one. Is it, did it go a different color? Yeah. It might be working. This one, oh, this is a Zeus. This one gives me weird issues. I bought this one because it's got a plug on both sides and it's good to 15 amps. And so actually I had two UPSs on my home lab that ran into both sides of this so I could monitor power on each leg of it. And then if all of a sudden the power dropped off one side, I could trigger automation and be like, oh, my power just dropped, my UPS just died. That's how I was monitoring my UPS. Uh, this one might not be happy. We can skip that one for now. Okay, let's go back to our automation. And we're gonna create a scene. And the scene will be lamp on. And these icons, you're gonna say, who wants to use icons? That's really silly. They're great, because that's how you can visually distinguish stuff. Um, so, and they're actually pretty, like that looks like a little bit of a desk lamp. And the areas in the classroom, and the device we're gonna grab is the AM Labs one. And right there is this, that's the, make sure that's the right one. And there's one. So generally what you'll do, oh, there it is. There's the control for it. So what you'll do is when you're setting these up, you toggle them to how you want it to be in the scene. And that took me quite a while to figure out. Cause if I turn it off, that means the scene will be, this is off. If I toggle it on while I'm building the scene, scene is on. So we're gonna add that. And you can add more on there, of course. We're gonna save that. And we're going to go to automations, we're going to create an automation, and we're going to do an empty one. Now, this automation is going to be turn lamp, turn on lamp, easy. Triggers are what trigger the automation. Now, you can trigger based on calendars, um, different devices to input, so we could actually just um, pick up. Can you turn it on when we cast to the Roku? Let's try. So say we want to like dim the lights. Roku lever change. Okay, Roku lever is starts it's buffering. Playing. It starts playing right there. So so this will turn on the lamp when the Roku starts playing. Okay. Conditions are like if you want to set like I only want it to happen at night. Only want to happen during day. Only want to happen on Tuesdays. Um, I only want it to happen when the Google Cast is not playing. Yeah, yeah. And you can tie all those, all those beautiful things in. So device will be, uh, so it's not device, you're actually gonna do a, what do they call that? Script, I believe. Mm -hmm. Activate scene, and lamp on, and save. Okay, so now we have an automation that should turn on the lamp um, when the Roku Traveler starts playing. So what we'll do first is I'm gonna Turn that off. Well, that, that turns off the automation, sorry. Um, let's see, it's a button. Why am I reaching the button? I've got automation, I could have done it from the comp. <laughs> Whatever. You've become your wife. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, okay, so if I run the actions, let's just make sure the scene works for it. Oh, it doesn't. Let's fix that. Activate scene, lamp on. I don't know why the see scenes. Lamp on, play that scene. Nope, it didn't. That scene doesn't work. So that's one. That's a great thing that we're troubleshooting is you can actually run these things so you can run your automation, or you can run your scene to debug where your problem is in your logic. So lamp on switch. It's working. It didn't know it was off. I wonder if it didn't update. Now run it. Like turn it off through the home automation. Yeah, let's go turn it on. Through the automated. Okay, great. It is on right now. So we're gonna go back to the overview. We're gonna turn it off. Okay. Now we're on here. Let's go back to our scene. There we go. So it thought it was still. They on, thought it was on. And your thing didn't tell it that it turned off when you pushed the button. Now it could be a few things. It could be my ad logic problems. It, it also could be the Z-Wave network's pretty fragile because it's the stick in this device and it might not be updating itself very well. So it's a very fragile Z-Wave network. So now if we go back to our automation. 
And if we run the actions for the Omnum, okay, that works. So we're good there. Let's go turn that one back off. Now, hold on. <laughs> Uh, let's see, camera. So, okay, it, it, we don't start playing, right? Not on buffering. Yeah. Come on. Oh, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> Woo! Now, expand this out to a scene where you tell your little ones, hey, I want you to go to bed at 10, and they've got tablets. If you install a home assistant, the app on their tablet, you can pull states from the tablet. What do you mean by states? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> by states, I'm meaning um, you could have it leave, it pull, pull battery status, charging status, whether it's playing media, location, all that. So did I just create a very... So you're saying when my phone gets low, my lights in my house can warn me that I'm about to run out of battery. I am saying that, yes. Especially if I set a travel time or I like... And do conditions. Okay, so I'm going to join... Speaking of that, um, what about geofencing? Uh, not Wi-Fi, but um, GPS. It does support that. Um, you have to do the Home Assistant app to get kind of get that presence on your phone. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it does support that. So let me get this cheap tablet to um, join my little temporary network here. Okay, I think we should be good. Um, so these are Kindle Fires. I buy these when these go on sale for like twenty nine ninety nine. dollars um, I buy the ones with special offers. And you're going to say, why do you buy the ones with special offers? Two reasons. One, it can't talk to the internet. Ever. It's on my IoT network. It can talk to local stuff. Two, I never lock it because it's running in a tablet mode. If it's never locked, it can never show you ads. So why not buy the cheap one? <laughs> Um, there's a cool app called Fully Kiosk Browser, where you can actually set really cool stuff to like have the tablet dim when you're not around it, and it'll use that front camera to brighten itself as it presents as you walk up to it. You can also run screensavers as GIFs or whatever. So I've got Matrix GIF that come down on all of them when I'm not up to it, and as I walk up to the tablet, it presents itself with the data. So, kind of cool. That's real cool. If you do your home controls for like alarming on it, make sure you do some kind of pattern lock or something on it, because otherwise, like I said, the bad guy will go and turn your alarm off which is less than ideal. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to join this up. 99.139, okay. And that should do it. Okay, so as you can see, do you want to show that on the camera? You can see the hacker space. Oh, it's right there. You see the hackerspace home assistant I've set up. I'm going to join it. Okay, I'm going to log in. Don't log in as your administrative user if you're going to have tablets around your house because you don't want someone to be able to change your automations and break stuff. So make sure you go in here, make yourself a user for your tablets. That's what I like to do. Um, if you're going to give it to your your Sydney and others, your children, whatever, identify it so you can identify it. Uh, this will be called tab 10. You can set a picture. The picture is used if you do geofencing. You can actually bring up a map and it'll put them on the map where they are. So you could have an at a glance view of where the family is if you were wanted to do that. Um, tab 10, passwords 801 labs, 801 labs. Now this switch is right cool. Can only log in from the local network. Some people forward the port of home assistant out to the internet. Some people do. Now, good news is um, it actually does support MFA. So you can do a, a TOTP and do a Google Authenticator and, uh, and, and expose that to the internet. I wouldn't do that. I'd much rather have set up a zero tier or some kind of VPN and VPN in if I really want to hit it. Um, but some people do that. I'm not one of those people. Okay, so tab 10. We're gonna go like this. I don't know why I called it tab 10 because isn't that a Samsung tablet? Yeah, that is. Sorry, Samsung. My bad. Well, if you've got a tab one or a two or a three, you can feel sad too. Yeah. Okay, we're going to log in here. And so right here, I'm going to name the device. And the device is going to be called Fire Tablet because I remembered this time. And I'm going to enable location tracking. 
I'm going to allow that. And I'm going to let it run in the background. I'm basically doing Android permissions right now, over here. Yeah, someone take the tablet and drive around the block. <laughs> okay, cool. So now we have a tablet added. So if we go back to our overview, there is the tablet. And that's the history of where it is and what it's done. These are basically users that are shown. But there's a sensor. The battery temperature is at 75.2 degrees on the Fire tablet. <laughs> now, every device is going to present the data that it gives differently. Some will expose everything. Some will not expose much. iPhone exposes everything, like into including the health data if you allow it, meaning I can trigger automations, I kid you not, based on how many flights of stairs I've climbed in a day. So maybe heart rate. Come with me on this journey if like you if you're in a specific room and your heart rate goes up, like the lights start getting excited. <laughs> but imagine this journey where I have not walked like you're, like you're doing a treadmill. Okay. <laughs> it's not what I was thinking. Sure, man, sure. So this is what it's pulling up. I was thinking the health data of like, I haven't walked enough for the data. Maybe I can keep my fridge locked until I go for a walk. <laughs> If you could, if you had a smart fridge with a locking door, but I bet I could. You could rig one. I could make one. <laughs> we can make that. We have the technology. So yeah, um, that this doesn't stop me from getting the Oreos in the pantry, though. Yeah. So this and is I kind of a, this is kind of a terrible. Um, this wasn't a show. Does someone have a? Does someone want to pair their phone? I'll do my phone. Why not? So the the energy consumption still is zero. Yeah, it's not pulling that data, and that's really surprising. It should be. That could be a problem with the driver. Um, so when you go and click, and when you go and look at the device, um, I, what do they call them? Are they handlers in Z-Wave World, or a device handler? Isn't that what they call it? Where it basically has the functionality that the thing provides you. I think it's called a handler. Um, Home Assistant's super cool about um, the supported devices. Is like the best I've ever seen as far as. Um, as like completeness of which devices work. Uh, where is the supported dongle? They've got a whole set of like the devices you can use with it. Is that on the right under categories? Categories, unseen services, events, segmentation. Support devices. Where, where is it? Support devices and command classes. Uh, check out their device database. This is the most literally complete one I've ever seen of any platform. Hubitat, smart things, anything. And you can just go by anything, like Aeon Labs. There's all the Aeon Labs devices, and it has all of them. And also, like, the groups, um, the different modes, like what the buttons can do, all that stuff. Super great. Even if you're not going to run a home assistant, this is a great tool if you're running Z-Wave at all, just to see what the different classes are and all that good stuff. I don't know why we're not picking up... Um, energy that's super frustrating on previous ones i've used if the draw is low enough it doesn't measure it it could be that's just a little tiny five water or 15 water it should be enough though let's fix that <laughs> you can turn my my laptop off when we stop playing media <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's uh you know, you'd have to set up a separate scene with automation for that, right? For what? To have it turn off when it stops. That separate yes. from the on yes. when it starts. Now, I'm glad that's a great thing. The, so the question is, you'd have to set up another automation to turn that off when the media stops. You will do that, and I've done that so many times. I'm like, I have the sweet automation, and I left my lights on all night because I didn't have the um, corresponding turn off. One cool thing they did is they have blueprints, and the blueprints, oops, let me do that. The blueprint actually have a motion activated light, which has an on and off and zone notification. So that's a really easy blueprint they added for us. And I use the motion one quite a bit. Um, so is your laptop pulling data or pulling charge? Yes. It's not. You can hear it. It works. It's not pulling it. It says it's seen 24 minutes ago, so it hasn't gotten an update in 24 minutes from that. Time. Yeah, it's not pulling it, is it? Uh, let's see if it's a card problem. So we're going to go into dashboarding real quick. 
and we're going to add a dashboard and we're going to call this uh, temp. And now you can make some of these admin only. So remember when I created that tablet user that wasn't an admin. So I can make admin ones if you want to. Um, so there's the temp. We're going to open that one. Now temp starts as an overview. And so when you take it over, like I mentioned, um, it blanks everything out. So you can add a card. And so let's go by. Now there's two ways to do um, at, uh, when you're creating, there's two ways to do it. You can either do it by like function or like what it looks like, like an entity or whatever. The easier way to do it is by entity and just go find your device. And then it'll suggest one. So we're going to do uh, Watts right there. See, it's not pulling anything. But let's grab, so if you grab multiples, it'll do what's called an entity card where it'll show them all in one. That's what they look like. But if you do just single ones, you can do kind of niftier ones. Uh, oh, there's the fire tablet uh, battery level. 81%. So let's add that one just for fun. We're going to pick a different card and we're going to do the gauge. And there's my tablet level and save. So pretty cool. You could actually have a dashboard of all the battery levels of your devices. Now you're saying, that's a silly thing. Why would you do that? If you've got wireless sensors all over your house that run on batteries, it's nice at a glance to have all your battery status of every sensor. Super handy. Know which ones to change and which they ones to leave alone. And practically change. Yep. But again, they have to support doing that. Hey, do you have a preference over uh, Z-Wave Z light switches? So I have never, ever been burned by the GE slash Jaskos. Ever. Are they I, easy installs? Are they easy to install? Yeah. Yeah, they're not too bad. Um, the, so the question is the preference on the actual in-wall Z-Wave light switch. Mm -hmm. um, I've ran Zuzes, and I've replaced four of those already. And... I'm willing to like give a pass on something broken or something wasn't great. And to be fair, Zoos was good. They replaced the first one for free under warranty. The next two, they offered me a discount code. And then the other two, I just didn't even bother because I didn't want to keep playing with it. Um, th I will give Zoos one awesome thing that they do. Theirs can use, if you have a three-way light switch, you can use your traditional rocker over here yeah. and signal with this one without having to buy the matching pair of Z-Wave ones. Super cool that they do that. I do like that a lot. But I do the GEZ at Jaskos because they've never failed me. Now that said, they are not the easiest to install, especially when you do something like this and you got four of them sitting in a box side oh, by that's side. It's hard to pack all the wires in there. That was not fun. The trick with those is the Wacos. Yeah. The instead of the wire nuts. Yeah. If you if you try to put wire nuts in all of those, you'll end up cracking panels and pull up a picture of Waco just so yeah. people see what you're talking about. They're amazing. Uh, close that. Again. How do they, I can't really spell it. W. Are you saying Geo? It's Geo. Oh, Wago, not Wago. Wago, sorry. I was thinking Texas. So you're saying those will crack or won't? No, these are fantastic. <laughs> yeah, because they're smaller than wire nuts. Yeah, there's. Go, yeah, go to images. Yeah, Google images. Yeah, that's that's yes, easier. Huh. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. Just they're tiny little guys. Yeah, you can't. Lock on the, end of a wire. the one with the wire right there. Oh, is this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those things are the best. Are they more expensive than wire nuts? A little bit. Yeah. 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 A little bit more. Your, your time is worth more than they cost. <laughs> and honestly, trying to cram four of those in there is just. Trying to put wire. Like, you have to get a monster wire nut if you're doing like three or four wires. And it's just these ones are super thin. You have to twist the it. wires around everything. Yeah. And it's just they awful. sit flat against the back of the box. Back and so the those are Jaskos, and trying to get those side by side, you have to break those heat spreader fins off to get them all to fit in that multiple game box. Ooh. You have to be careful that you're not putting a load too high on them. I have my ceiling fans on these, and they're fine. They run just great because these are relay based, so they just on off. So you're good there. Um, let's check. So while well, we're here, I'll show you my tablet. Um, so this is the dashboard I have. So this is one of those cheap Kindle tablets talking to, and to my Blue Iris NVR. And so I can pull up cameras just on this icon here on the left. It's just my every camera I've got across the house. And then you can click on an individual image, pop that up full screen. Is Blue Iris integrated into Home Assistant? You have to use the uh, community package, but yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, this is my power meter one. So you can see how much power my home's using. It was using 1400 watts at the time. Um, there's my time over the last six hours, and then that's the Tesla charger when it kicks on. I can see how many amps it's pulling. What is that spike? Do you know? This one right here? Yeah, 10 my, p.m. That was my oven. <laughs> it was time for a corn dog. <laughs> <laughs> 
But it's fun because you see those spikes. Things that don't take a lot of power, like you don't realize like how much power certain things take. Like vacuums. Like you think, oh yeah, vacuums. You turn on the vacuum, it's like boom. It's like what is using all this power? Here's the vacuum, right? My air compressor out in my garage. So that cycles every now and then. Big old power bumps. Um, so that's the charger stuff. Um, that's the power dashboard. This is what I call my glance dashboard. Um, this is just weather and the ceiling fans. Just I like to have quick toggles. And these are my thermostats upstairs and downstairs. So I can control the thermostats from up here. Um, one of the worst automations I ever made, and I'm somewhat ashamed to admit this, there is an automation I made once where if a user went up to the thermostat and adjusted it, it would accept the input and it would make the relay click and a minute later, it set it back to what it was. <laughs> <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> That's why you got divorced the first time. I'm not blaming on the automation, but I'm not saying it helped. <laughs> um, you'll see I've got a, a regular traditional alarm panel next to it just because I wanted to do that separation, like I mentioned. Um, things I ever wanted to get into, like, really, like, my most exciting thing was just to kind of get you all excited and thinking about it. Um, another cool automation, I can't demo it here because I don't have a colored light, but I can pull weather information and if it's going to rain or snow in the next five minutes, I just blink a blue light, say, oh, it's going to start raining or snowing, have it go yellow when it's that. Um, what does red mean? Down to the minute. So like dark sky, huh. so you can get dark sky down. To the... sh are they shutting their API down at the end of the year? Yeah, it, but if they are, they're shutting that down. The, the funny thing is, it, remember when I mentioned that... Um, the integrations and how robust they are. It's like, okay, well, if that one's not good enough, there are literally six weather ones that all tie in. Cool, so these are the things out of the box. Now, I'm gonna kick over to my real, and this is my real production home automation stuff. So this is that panel that I showed you before. Um, I mentioned hacks. Now, this is where you tie into your GitHub account and you can pull community things. So integrations, um, this is how I'm talking to Hubitat and Blue Iris. These are community ones. These aren't official on there. But what were the ones that went run on here that we wanted to check? Uh, what is one? Beehive? B B H yeah. Y Orbit? Yep. Beehive? Yes. That's yep. the one. So there's oh, a community I one. So they had no red? So yep, yeah, no red. Yeah. Here's um, the important one too. Twitter? Or Nintendo Switch. Dang, they still have Twitter. <laughs> Twitter doesn't like giving out their API anymore. Uh, so here's your Nintendo wish list, a sensor monitor Nintendo Switch wish list for games on sale. You could blink a light when something goes on sale, folks. <laughs> uh, do, do Steam sale. S -E -C -U -R Steam wish list. S-E-C what? S-E-C-U-R-I-F-I. I, I saw it there. The UVs? S-E-C-U-R. I-F-I. Ooh, they do have one. Securify, RESTful API, that one? Sweet. Yeah. That's a router that has a Zigbee and a Z-Way hub, hub built into it. Oh, cool. Yeah, so the community, like, really fills in the gaps that, like, I've yet to find something that I've had to code myself, which is awesome. Like, I love everything. Um, if you're, Sonos, if you want to do Sonos, uh, Plex. Uh, Plex is a native integration. Um, most of your smart TVs, your like LGs, your Sammies, all your other things will actually tell you what the, what the media is playing. So, and you can also play pause. So if you want to do time limits on kids, you could say Monday through Friday, 10 o'clock, media pause or media stops. So you could do that too. Um, so that's just the repos for integrations. There's actually front, front, end, front end um, customization as well that people have made to do different layout, uh, dark thermostat themes, so you're not stuck in the box of the, the cards that they present you for your dashboards. You can actually go to the community and people have written some really cool ones and pull them in. Um, can, can you show us how the Hubitat integration works? Absolutely. Uh, so let's go to their configuration. Me and being a Hubitat person that has used it for years, I would be interested to see that. So you go, you have to go and import it in, and um, it uses their Maker API to make the calls for it. I know what that is. Cool. So you have to go enable the Maker API in your habitat. You give it a long live access token mm -hmm. for it. And then once you pull it in through hacks, it actually comes in straight up as your regular integration. 
And so it shows up here as a traditional integration along with everything else. That's amazing. And so the cool thing is you can see these ones with the little box that tells me it's a custom integration coming from um, a third party. Um, the cloud ones are cloud native ones, right? Yeah. And a lot of these are ones like I still have a rat shield that I haven't replaced out. I've, I've, there's a lot of things I haven't ripped out yet. Octoprint, that's mine. My TV, all that good stuff. Uh, home kit for watches and all that lovely. Um, but if you go into the configure on the Hubitat, you basically just give it the, port, the IP of it. Okay. Um, but if you go into your devices, those are all the devices I have across the house. Um, to refresh the devices, you're going to probably want to figure that out. You just um, bounce the home assistant service. Because okay. what you'll do is you'll add everything through Hubitat, get all excited, and it doesn't show up. You have to bounce that service to get it to come back. So does your rod shield work without getting on the internet? Uh, no, that is an inter internet one. Mm -hmm. it, it does have to go to the internet and come back. But I don't consider that like necessary for the function in the house, so I allow it. And I break my own rules, I'll be honest. Like, I say these things, but I was like, it's the same thing as like, I never put prod on home lab. Yes, I do, all the time. <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> um, I'll show you my lights dashboards. These are kind of cool. So these are, and I think my girlfriend's actually at the house. So if I start flashing lights, she'll probably get a mean text. Please but... do it. <laughs> the same light right there. There's the kitchen light. Sorry. She's going to watch this. There's the cabinet lights. Yeah. Wait, so you have, you have. So I've got, yes, right. I've got lights above my cabinets that are LEDs, and so I can blink those up, so they're like the uh, kind of indirect lighting. It's all cozy. Have you seen um, Parasite, the uh, Korean film? Mm -mm. Am I doing that right now? Okay, great. I, <laughs> so the lamp's at 50... Guy's trapped in the basement and so, using Mort's code for his automated lights. So really, lights on and off, she'll notice. If I just turn it to that much brightness, probably won't notice that one. <laughs> Um, but I've organized. Color. <laughs> but I've organized these based on the room, and like I said, I've got a bunch of these fire tablets that are just glued to the walls, and so these are my touch. So pads. how do you mount them to the walls? Like you say, glued, but I, I'm do you not. literally glue it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go out to Thingiverse, uh, some wonderfully nice person, a fire wall mount. Um, do, do, do. A lot of people have made some. A lot of them are good. This one in particular is quite nice, if you'll notice right there. <laughs> <laughs> some nice guy. Um, but yeah, that's that was my first test fitting of it. Um, what I did though is I, I it's two pieces, and you just um, drywall anchor that into your wall, and then you slide the tablet in, and then there's a front cover piece. Um, that just friction fits into these pins, so you can pull it out if you need to. Whole idea being sometimes they crash, sometimes they die, and I need to get to the buttons, but I didn't want to have the buttons exposed all the time. And so I've got cutouts for ventilation a little bit, and then I can just slide that out, push the button, and snap it back in. And how do you, how do you power it? So I've got a 90 degree USB-C that goes into it. Okay. Um, how I'm powering them, I'm cheating in some places. In some places, I, they go into an unfinished room in my house where I've got outlets on the other side, so I just go, boop, <laughs> just go out the back of the wall into a wall wart. Um, I reused a lot of my home um, security system wiring. They ran the hard, the old contact sensors through my whole house. I find one of those close enough, pop it out, put a little 12 volt uh, supply down in the basement, and then a 12 volt to USB plug in the box. And then I just have a little six inch USB C. 12 volt to 5 volt. 12, to five, 12 volt to 5 volt step down. Okay. Yeah. So that's how I'm doing it. You can also do PoE to USB. Yeah. yeah. You could do PoE to USB. There's tons of ways. Usually you can find something close enough. Um, I've even seen some folks like replace their outlets with the kind with the USBs and then just did kind of put it in and then go behind the thing and out. Well, it's kind of silly, but you can do that. Have you ever had one die? A tablet or a tablet. yes. And I buy them, I stock up when they have the prime day. Like what, what kills them? The screens, I don't think the screens are built to be running 24-7 like I use them. But they last at least a year and a half, two years. That's the, the earliest I've had one die. Which, for 30 bucks, is... You're paying more for a light switch. Really. Like, a, a GE's at Jasco is 50 bucks, right? Um, so, some folks do have... Hard, does anyone have a hardwired security system still? Still have one? Cool. This is a product that I wanted to buy, but it would have been way too expensive. Uh, it's called Connected. Connected with a K... Um, well, that's the Home Assistant integration. There is a Home Assistant integration for it. Oh, goodness, we're typing in front of people. Uh, connected. This is a takeover for your panel. And so you've got these tiny little um, 
Here's the insulation guy this probably. Wow, just give me a picture, please. You just put it on top of your old panel, right? Yeah, you can either run them in line or you can replace your panel with it, and this will feed these sensors directly into Home Assistant. Uh -oh. So if you've got all those sensors already in there, you yeah. can feed it right in. That's cool. So even if you don't use it as a standalone security system, you could use it for triggers or for anything you want. Is that the ESP8266 that it's built on? Yeah. Nice. You could build your own, but they've put it in a nice little package. The thing that bothered me is I wanted the Pro because that's powered by PoE, but it only did 12 zones, and I had like 18 zones, so I'd need two of those. It's 230 bucks just for one 12-zone yeah. thing. That's so, a lot of money so I was like, for an ESP32. So I was like, I could either make my own, or I can just do that abode system like I did that's another Z-Wave network that I'm already familiar with, and the batteries last 10 years, so I'm like, eh, I'm good with it. Well, cool. That is mostly what I had for you. Does that have any other questions or like really the whole idea was get excited and start building crazy stuff. Right, we're good. Thank cool. you. Thank you so much.